right, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History at Tenry Zamoda and Danny Ev Deljabar. What's up, man? M- Happy Christmas, Danny. Happy Christmas. I'm chilling, man. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty well. Um, we should be releasing this episode on Christmas. So Happy if it is Christmas. Christmas Day and you're listening, Happy Christmas or Merry Christmas. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, we're, in fact, recording this a couple days prior to our usual recording date. Um, it is Tuesday, the 22nd. And um, right now, just to let you know in advance, I am outside of my normal recording um, environment. I'm traveling, so I'm not, I don't have the same uh, recording setup that I usually have. So if I don't sound super crisp, then it's because uh, I had to make a little makeshift setup right here. But I guess you guys are, are pretty used to our audio being somewhat inconsistent at this point. So I'm sure, <laughs> you know, if you're a fan of the show, you're going to forgive us. We've, we've actually up, got Dan? a system of cans set up, right? Like cans with string in between. And that's how we're recording this episode today. Well, that's how we first started this show. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And, and honestly, the upgrades we've made have not been that significant. No, no, not exactly. No. Yeah. Maybe we're a little still... easier for us to work with, but. It's yeah. still uh, it's still a very grassroots operation. Uh, <laughs> collectively, the equipment we use is uh, not state of the art. We're we're, <laughs> we're using like 2014 equipment. Yep. But you know that's grassroots for you. Um, but what's up, man? How are you? Good, man. I'm I'm excited uh, to have a couple of short you know weekends, uh, short weeks here. You know for the for the break here, I'm I'm excited about you know uh, Christmas and New Year's and. Um, yeah, man, I, I've got no complaints right now. So, And I'm also really pumped about this episode because I've, I've been having a lot of fun, you know, doing the last couple of episodes with you on these ancient histories for, for a change. Now I'm not like, you know, getting upset at the things that I am reading. <laughs> I'm just kind of like fascinated by everything that I learned. So uh, it's a nice change of pace, man. Yeah. So, um, so far the feedback has been pretty, mostly positive about our ancient history podcast that we've been doing. So um, we're going to be continuing to do that um, again, at the very least until the end of this year, maybe we'll bleed into next year. If you guys still want this content, but uh, we've been diving into ancient history. Um, we got some complaints about us going off topic sometimes, but um, <laughs> I mean, that's if just you the show. expect <laughs> the show to be something that's perfectly on the rails. <laughs> then uh, I'll just tell you right now, we, we frequently, Flying off the rails on topics is in the DNA of this show. Right. So if you want something that's straightforward, stick to the topic, then this show, you're probably not going to like it. (laughs) Uh, We frequently will diverge and digress into other topics without warning. I still remember Um, the the one episode that we had. This could end up being an argument. This whole episode could turn into a debate about the minimum wage, as far as we know. I mean, it might. um, (laughs) I I still remember the one episode that we had where... Uh, we went off on a tangent about the exhaust ports on the Death Star. I don't even remember the original topic of the show, but we went off on a good 20-minute run about just that. It had nothing yeah. to do with the topic. So pretty, I know. pretty emblematic, I, I think. Um, but during the last two episodes, we spoke about the rise of civil- civilizations during the Bronze Age, specifically ancient Suma in the Akkadian Empire, along with the Egyptian Empire, ranging from the Old Kingdom to the rise of the warrior pharaoh. Precisely covering a time period ranging between 3000 BC to 1200 BCE, and we ended our last discussion with the great cataclysm of biblical proportions that may have ended advanced Bronze Age civilizations along the Mediterranean coast. But within the rubble of the old world, like a phoenix reborn in her ashes, arose a new world, forging new empires, bounded by the blood of her foes. We're speaking about the Assyrian Empire. (laughs) Um, So what's interesting is that prior to the mid-19th century, um, most of what we knew about the Assyrian Empire was from the Bible. Yep. So... The reason being is that um, that many Mesopotamian societies, they used mud brick to build a lot of their structures, which is not sturdy. So we don't have as much lasting uh, evidence or at least like th- at least structures that have been that have lasted thousands of years just because a lot of them have, have ruined. 
Mm -hmm. Um, in Egypt, they used, uh, stone rather than, than mud brick, but a lot of the infrastructure couldn't be found. Therefore, a lot of historians were not even sure that the Assyrian empire even existed at all. However, in 18, in the 1840s, so this is somewhat recently, um, archeologists from France and Britain, um, they started finding palaces and they, they kept on finding palaces, mm-hmm. and eventually they would find entire cities, and they would be buried in sand. And one of these ancient cities that they found was the city of Nineveh, which was a great city of antiquity. Um, for example, it probably had around... I mean, as you, you never really know what these, these ancient numbers, but this is what historians estimate to have. The city probably had a population of around 200,000 people at its max. Which is so, nuts for pre like sanitation, like how they lasted without like either getting the plague or like just absolutely living in their own shit for the entire time is, is nuts that you can get a civilization to be that that big in that a time. A pre industrial civilization yeah. had a city of of over two hundred thousand people is quite frankly amazing. Um, the other ancient cities that you could point to being really big like this are, are cities like um, Rome, you know, right. c- cities that come centuries after this. But um, what happened to Nineveh is that it was destroyed and it was it was destroyed by its neighbors. And after a century of um, excavations and, and just translation of, of Mesopotamian text, Historians found out that these people were very warlike. Um, I would go as far as say to say that they had a depraved sense of cruelty towards other people, uh, city-states, and, and pretty much anyone who rebelled, rebelled against their imperial role. I remember the conversation we were having about the Assyrians in the Bible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way that the Bible tells it, they're pretty pretty fucking metal you know uh they're the they're the og head choppers you know these guys evidently made isis look like uh you know fucking a ragtag group these guys were the craziest people of the you know ancient times of the of the biblical era yeah. and um we, we know that well, well what co- collaborated a lot of that biblical message so now we know that that was most likely pretty accurate. true yeah <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty accurate, a pretty yeah. accurate depiction of them mm-hmm. is that many of the sculptures that we found um in these ancient assyrian cities they depict battles right they depict torture they depict people fighting lions um and when i say torture i mean like torture that would come from ramsey bolton in games of Th- game of thrones right people being flayed alive yep um one of their major people kings wearing... talks about like uh, uh, sacking a city and taking the, you know, the king of that city or the 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 regent of that city, flaying him and putting the skin on a pillar outside of the gates of the uh, of the um, of the city to show everybody like, hey, this is what happens when you rebel. It's pretty nuts. Exactly. It's like like crazy. So the Ramsey Bolton on steroids. Mm-hmm. This this was a civilization that was. Um, biblically cruel, would, I think would be a good way to describe it. Oh, yeah. um, and they sustained themselves through aggressive military raids. And, and, and more often than not, the people they conquered were just completely uh, subjugated and, and just treated like total dog shit. Yep. Um, and when I say dog shit, I mean that on a ancient bar. So heads, they had an obsession of, putting heads on spikes, Mm -hmm. um, flaying people, as we mentioned before, burning people alive. They liked cutting Um, people's noses off. That was a weird thing that I learned about. Did you hear that? Did you read that part? I don't know why, but they liked cutting people's noses off. They liked mutilating people's faces um, and poking people's eyes out. Just like really depraved, horrible things uh, that, you know, we, we don't really do unless you're a sicko, depraved nut. However, the, the impact that they, they leave is that the model that they create um, led them to create the, real, the first large-scale empire that dominated the Near East. And when I say the Near East, 
Um, I, I'm always referring to the Middle East when I say the Near East, but I I mean, I don't know if this is a, a, a rule, but a, at least how my brain does works this out is that when I say Middle East, I mean anything after the, the Arab conquest of uh, of the region mm -hmm. of uh, of the Middle East and, and North Africa. Right. Whenever I say the Near East, I mean anything before that. Antiquity, for, basically. In, antiquity. I don't know why. I don't know if that's the right way to refer it. We used to call the Near East, uh, the Middle East, the Near East until about the 1950s anyway. But mm -hmm. I, whenever I say the Near East, I mean the Middle East. But uh, they created the first large-scale empire that dominated uh, the Near East, um, the Mediterranean, uh, Asia, Asia Minor, uh, the Caucasus, uh, so Ar Armenia, um, and parts of the Arabian Peninsula, along with North Africa and Egypt. And furthermore, they create the the template for future empires. Uh, but but what's more important is that they force states in the Near East into large scale unity. So what that does is that they make future empires uh, have a easier time conquering lands and subjugating people into one imperial rule. They're the first ones that on a large scale, they conquer and they put everyone under one state government apparatus, mm -hmm. paving the way for other societies to do the same. For example, after the Assyrian Empire falls, it doesn't take too much. It doesn't really take long until the Persian Empire sweep in and they kind of pick everything up and everything's already in place for them. Like they already have the imperial structure in place. Right. What that allows the Persian Empire to do after that is that they actually are known as a lenient empire compared to the Assyrians. Well, yeah, like, I mean, compared you know, to the Assyrians, the Nazis are a lenient empire. It feels like, you know. The biblical Nazis. Um, yeah, that's basically the, what they are. The the biblical Nazis, but I think a lot of Western, uh, a lot of Westerners, their perception of the Persian Empire is that it was also like this giant hedonistic slave culture that just con had this uh, uh, depraved um, craving to conquer every single land, and a lot of that comes from. Um, the writings from ancient Greece that have been passed down from generation to generation where Greece, ancient Greece is kind of uh, uh, written about as the vanguard as what for Western civilization that prevented the Persians from taking over. In reality, uh, Persia was pretty lenient when it came to their imperial role. Uh, they did do horrible things, but compared to future empires such as uh, these, well, not Syria was in the past, but compared to even future empires like the Roman Empire or even, well, Alexander the Great kind of kept in the administrative units as a per, in the Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. But future empires were worse. Previous empires were worse than, than the Persian Empire. I'll just, I'll just leave it like that. But I have a quote from a historian, uh, Chester Starr. And he's an old school historian who wrote in the early 1900s. Um, the Assyrian period was in reality one of the greatest turning points in the civilized history of the area. The next great empire, the Persian, reaped the benefits and could afford to exercise its sway with more in a more in a more lenient style. Mm -hmm. Now, the brutal methods that the Assyrians uh, live by eventually lead to their downfall. The reason why Nineveh was wiped out like Hiroshima, because basically it was wiped out mm -hmm. like uh, Hiroshima, mm -hmm. um, because they were so ruthless, their enemies hated them. And their enemies hated them so much that they gave them the, I guess, the equivalent of the Carthage, the Carthage treatment, where they completely wiped out their civilization. Right. They wiped them off the face of the earth. And this predates Carthage so, by quite a bit too. So um, it's it's interesting because I think the, what you point out makes is super important. They were super brutal to all of their neighbors and all the people that they conquered. Um, but o almost almost religiously, almost like as a as a foreign policy, like their foreign policy was legitimately terrorism, right? Scare the shit out of people, like brutalize the shit out of people so that they know not to try nothing 
And, you know, it, like from a modern standpoint, that sounds like, all right, well, duh, right? Like that's what you do when you're a brutal dictator and you want to, you know, create an empire. You know, you just, just like cut off people's heads and put it on a pike and leave it outside the door and then people know not to fuck with you. But what's interesting about that is that the Assyrians were the ones who wrote the playbook on this. And not only did they write the playbook, but they did the craziest shit. And this was just like their foreign policy. And, you know, we going into like studying for this, I had the impression or the idea that, you know, the biblical accounts uh, or even the Greek accounts of the Assyrians uh, were like exaggerated. (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh, that, that, yeah, they probably killed a lot of people, but, you know, that's usually what happens with dictators. And I think, oh, you know, in, you know, 5,000 years or something like that, when we look back at the United States empire, you know, are, are people going to write about us in the same way that they wrote about the Assyrians? But then we go to the source material of the Assyrians by the Assyrians and no, no, they're, they're very unapologetically brutal. Like they talk in great detail and they outline in great detail what it is that they did. And they're, they seem very happy about it. Um, it was like a policy. <laughs> it was their playbook. Like it wasn't just like a like an, uh, a product of their, you know, uh, culture or their per- or, or a particular ruler's personality. It was like all of them, for like fifteen hundred years or more, were just as a policy fucking brutal. And it paid back in spades. Exactly. <laughs> when you're when you're that brutal, karma was a bitch. <laughs> your, your neighbors hate you. Yeah. Yeah, your neighbors hate you and they want to annihilate you off. They they will um, freshly conquered people, especially they will want to conquer you in the same way that you conquered them. Um, but let's let's give some historical background. Yeah, on sure. this. So we're going to focus on the Neo Assyrian period. So that's a period that lasts approximately from 1912 BC to 608 BC, um, and this is when the Assyrians were at the height of their civilization. I think it's important to investigate this period because we learn a little bit more about the birth of modern empire Mm -hmm. here. So let's just pull this back a bit. So documented history in Assyria, it stretches back to 2000 BC. So it was originally a small state centered in the city of Asher in Northern Iraq. And it rose to prominence during the late bronze age. So late bronze age, around 1600 to 1100 you know dates kind of irrelevant right here but you get the picture it just depends Um, on where you want to peg it right Mm -hmm. yeah depends on where you want to peg it uh when it gained independence from its neighboring kingdom uh, the mitanni and after it gained independence it embarked on a program of territorial expansion so the assyrian king asher ubalit um, he cemented Assyria's newfound status by becoming a latecomer to the Great Power Club. And what the Great Power Club is, it's a term, it's used by historians to refer to the power players in the ancient Near East and, and Egypt um, in the late Bronze Age. Hmm. So these power players were Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, the Hittites, and Mitanni. So if you look at a map of this period, uh, of, of all the great powers in the Near East, it kind of looks like a map of pre-World War One Europe. A little bit. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And where the, what Assyria is, and we've talked about this in our podcast about the Akkadian Empire and ancient Sumer, um, they're a lot like Germany when it comes to, in this map. Oh, yeah. So when we think of Germany, and I'm not even going to try to compare them to a moral in a moralistic setting as, you know, to, to Nazis, but as far as their, ge- their how geography shapes different societies Absolutely. to become yeah. militaristic or not. Mm-hmm. So uh, Iraq, uh, Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and the Euphrates Empire, uh, uh, rivers, these, uh, a lot of foot traffic goes through there. There's no natural boundaries. They don't have the same natural boundaries as Egypt does with these with deserts. It's not like they a mountain have range some, or anything like that, you know. Yeah, it's not they like don't a have the mountain ranges. <laughs> yeah, uh, in Persia, um, or or in you know, in places like Central Asia, uh, it's just a place where you can walk and march and, and migrate and immigrate to immigrate to. So, 
this geography creates the fear of being surrounded. In World War I, Germany's greatest fear was being surrounded by its neighbors. Mm-hmm. But specifically, they were their, their biggest um, national security policy was based off having France to the west of them and having Russia to the east of them right. and them both being allies. Right. So they had this fear of being surrounded and dominated. Uh, the same thing applies to Assyria from where they're located. And the same thing that applied to their, I guess their spiritual successor, the Akkadian Empire um, in, in, in the third millennium BC. In the late Bronze Age, there was this cataclysmic collapse in a lot of societies, which redesigned the political landscape of the Near East. So, for example, the the Hittite Empire disappeared. Right, gone. Uh, just gone. Pretty much immediately. Yeah. Um, Egypt was didn't disappear, but it was badly crippled during its war with the Sea Peoples. Um, Babylon took a huge hit. This cataclysm, we spoke about this last episode. Mm-hmm. It's pretty unclear what happened, but a lot of historians point to um, invaders like the Sea Peoples, right. who eventually became, or who some historians believe are the uh, um, the the Philistines in the Bible. Also, like uh, some some like natural disasters, right? So the, the climate actually shifted quite a bit, which caused a whole lot of droughts. Um, specifically in Egypt, uh, the Nile would normally, uh, it would normally uh, flood regularly around the same time every single year. And due to some climate changes, uh, that ceased to happen for, uh, I think it was a few decades actually. And uh, that basically eroded the, you know, the, 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 the idea that the pharaoh was like a, a deity, a god almost, right? And that that caused a huge decline in his, like, credibility because now he's not predicting, you know, stable flooding, which was the lifeblood for them. And a lot of things were happening like that across the region. Now, in Mesopotamia, the flooding was very fucking random, so it was, like, harder to, to point out. But there were definitely, um, you know, climate-related uh, issues which— uh, you know, hurt the, you know, the unified global economy uh, in that Near East and North African uh, region for sure, right? So one goes down, they kind of all start coming down because they were doing a lot of trading, uh, especially in, you know, uh, Mesopotamia, where while it's called the Fertile Crescent and you can grow crops there, they lacked a lot of natural resources. So they needed to be able to trade with other empires or just straight up ransack them uh, in order to get what they needed. And if, you know, a number of them started going under, whether it's because of the sea people, whether it's because of, you know, uh, uh, climate change, then that starts to affect all of them. Yeah. Um, and let's just say if it was climate change and it led to, even if it was, it was, um, famine in another part of the world, that famine could have led to large scale migration, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which were, for, which which caused new famine, <laughs> yeah. AKA, AKA the Sea People, right? Um, it's, couldn't they think of a better name than the Sea People? I don't know. I kind of like it. I, I'm. It's it's know, growing. It's growing on me because it's like so generic. You know, it's like it, we're not pointing to a, like a, a nationality or like a race. It's just just Sea People. Do you think <laughs> they would have called it what it is in Greece? Like oh, the Mycenaeans like, or some shit like that. You like know? the like something like that. So it sounds a little bit. Uh, cooler, but it's just the fact that it's in English. And it's like the Sea People came and <laughs> conquered all these areas. <laughs> sea People, but I, I I do I like it too. <laughs> um, but during this this uh, cataclysm in in the Mediterranean in the Mediterranean world, um, Assyria is located off the coast, so it's in Iraq. Iraq is landlocked, mm-hmm. or, or at least where they would you know the Assyrian Empire would be located. It's in northern Iraq. Um, right. They're not touching the sea yet. It's not touching the sea yet. So they're kind of unscathed through this, or at least not as significantly impacted by this huge uh, devastation that goes on during the last, during, during the end of the Bronze Age. So they're kind of like the U.S. during after World War II. Right. So they emerge as one of the major powers that come out of this period. 
And I mean, they took some blows too, right? Like they're, they were severely diminished as well. It's just not as bad as everybody else. I mean, they still existed unlike the Hittites. Yeah. They, they still existed unlike the Hittites who this, the, the think about the scale of like these cities that all had like 30,000 people living in them, 40,000 people living in them, like large urban population centers for the time, just being eradicated and erased from history and yep. no one probably just erased. No one knows who, what they are. Their, their place in history is gone. Um, just hundreds of these settlements just gone. Um, Which as a side tangent note, when I was um, like listening to that uh, hardcore history that you sent me from Dan Carlin uh, on this particular subject, what was it? Xenon, Zeno something, the, the Greek dude who was running from the Persians. Uh, and he just happened to run into the, you know, uh, uh, Nineveh, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and he just stumbled across a fucking ancient palace that was basically crumbling that had been left for like 200 years or more. And, you know, the local people's were telling him that it was the Medes uh, yeah. ancient city. But like, how is it that like a giant ass city, which, and he was describing it, it was like, you know, fucking 18 mile long, you know, walls around it. How is it that just like a city that's still technically standing, just everybody forgets about it. And nobody decides to like, hey, this is pretty cool. I'm going to set up shop here and like live here. You know, like how is it that it's just like people just forget about it and then never come back to it? Imagine if the U.S. fell and our and like Manhattan. population was eradicated and uh some you know uh settler comes to the u.s with all the buildings still in place yep. and um the locals there are like they're like who built these magnificent structures and there's like oh we think the british made them or canada i think it might have been canada <laughs> it could have been canada or the britons <laughs> yeah or the british we're not we're not really sure and nobody lives um, there <laughs> you know like it's crazy it's, like that that just could happen it is. It is just nuts. It's one of the moments in history that I would love to see, like even more so than the um, than like the pyramids being built. Mm -hmm. I'd want to see what happened during this this uh, this just drop in civilization because we know what happened during our nearest dark age after the fall of Rome. Right. Like the, the Roman civilization fell, and, and then you know the the general standard of living declined for a couple of hundred years. But we don't like slogan, really know right? what happened there. Um, but Assyria emerges with um, a 300-year reign with very successful, powerful kings, and um, they have six imperial, six uh, six monarchs, beginning with um, Ashurnasirpal, Ashurnasirpal the second, Ashurnasirpal, and he conquers the Near East. Or at the very least, he creates proxy states in the region. And, and this guy's a bastard. Yeah. So um, here's a quote. Because we mentioned that it came from their text and how like, brutal that they were. They wrote about how what they did. They, this wasn't like hearsay or he said, she said, or like bi like biblical exaggeration. Just just listen to it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Henry. So, yeah, this is him talking about putting down a rebellion in the city of Hule. With the masses of my troops and my furious battle onset, I stormed. I captured the city. 600 of their warriors I put to the sword. 3,000 captives I burned with fire. I did not leave a single one among them alive to serve as a hostage. Hule, their governor, I captured alive. Their corpses I formed into pillars. Their young men and maidens I burnt into the fire. Hule, their governor, I flayed his skin. And I sprayed upon the wall of the city of Dama Musa, the city I destroyed. I devastated, I burned with fire. Just fucking first of all, metal, right? This sounds like some, like yeah. the, the the lyrics to like a black metal song. And and second of all, again, just the way that he writes about it, it's like, yeah, I, I killed them all. Um I, you know, fucking burned them. I flayed the one dude, put a skin on the wall. Yep, I did that. And they're like proud about it, you know? Yeah. Well, he goes on. I captured 50 of their warriors I put to the sword. 200 of their captives I burned with fire. 332 men of the land of Nerbu I slew in a battle on the plain. Their spoil, their cattle, and their sheep I carried off. The land of Nerbu, which I set, which, I, which is at the foot of Mount Yore, had banded themselves together and had entered the city of Tela, their stronghold, from Kanubu. 
I departed to the city of Tella, I drew near. The city was exceeding strong and was surrounded by three walls. The men trusted in their mighty walls and in their host and did not come down and did not embrace my feet. With battle and slaughter, I stormed the city and captured it. Three thousand of their warriors I put to the sword, their spoil and their possessions, their cattle and their sheep I carried off. Man captives from among them I burned with fire, and many took as living captives, so slavery. From some I cut off their hands and their fingers, and from others I cut off their noses, their ears, and their fingers of many I put out their eyes. I made one pillar of living and another of heads, and I bound their heads to post around about the city. Their young men and maidens I burned in the fire. The city I destroyed, I devastated. I burned it with fire and consumed it. At the time, the cities of the land of Nerbi and their strong walls I destroyed, I devastated, I burned with fire. Talk about being a little repetitive in his yeah. in his uh, yeah. poetry. He wants he, want, he really wanted to narr- like bring it home that he burned three thousand people. Because he's but I guess it's just like the stat. It, it it was just kind of like the way that you communicated. Oh yeah, I burnt, burnt you know we burnt this city down. Here's another quote. I built a pillar over it, over against the city gate, and I flayed all the chiefs who had revolted, and I covered the pillar with their skins. Yeah. And he goes on about just uh, cutting off noses and poking eyes out of their head. And uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. And this is every, the point is, this is just one Assyrian king, um, Ashur, Ashur Nasipal, but Ashur Nasipal is not even known as one of the worst ones. Right. He's just one of the first ones. <laughs> He's just one of the first ones. A lot of the Assyrian, pretty much every Assyrian king, if you look at their writings or text directly from them, they sound exactly like this. Right. You wouldn't be able to tell one one uh, one from another. They all sound the same. Some of them are super matter of fact too. It's just like, yes, I burned exactly three thousand people. I took six hundred slaves. Uh, I ca- I carted off one thousand chariots, and I also took you know twelve hundred cattle and all this other stuff. So it's like in 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 one way it was record keeping, and in another way it was just like gloating about their, you know, um, their uh, kind of tirades because, again, this was their policy. Their policy was straight-up terrorism, and they wanted to make sure that they encapsulated how fucking brutal they were so that people knew, don't mess with Syria. Don't mess with us, Syria, I should say. Um, Another tactic they used was deportation. Ah, Yeah, that was nuts. Nuts. So um, they... Would what would they would do is that they would take a conquered people, they would just and then spread them out across the empire so they wouldn't be able to form some type of national identity, right? Which is a pretty smart, I guess, if you want to uh, assimilate people, right? Imagine, it, imagine assimil- if we took over like a bunch of Jets fans and then uh, you know sp- sprayed them all over the United States and now they can't worship the Jets anymore. No one worships the Jets, man. <laughs> um, except masochists. <laughs> um, they deported, uh, for example, tribes of Israel. They deported. Um, I am. I mean, the lost so, ten tribes of Israel are literally because the Assyrians did this to them. They came and like wrecked their shit, took them all, and here, put them in place. I actually have a quote from this. So Su- Susan Weiss uh, Bayer quotes, who's a like a classical one of the real famous classical historians uh deportation was a kind of genocide uh murder of not of a person's but of 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 a nation's sense of itself these israelites became known as lost 10 tribes not because the people themselves were lost but because their identity as descendants of abraham and worshipers of yahweh was dissipated uh dissipated dissipated in the new wild areas where they were now, now forced to make their homes it's unclear where, where uh, the Assyrians actually sent um, uh, the ten tribes of Israel, but uh, a lot of them are apparently supposed to be east of the Euphrates River um, in you know areas like uh, modern day Iraq and Iran, um, as well as some other places. Um, but they generally just spread them out. And again, the tactic here was pretty. I mean. As far as like a playbook goes for you know making an empire makes a, wh- a whole lot of sense, right? Because if you're going to brutalize a set of people, right, 
uh, one way to make sure that they don't end up revolting again is to spread them up, spread them out, right? And then they would repopulate the cities with their own people, you know, or or they would, you know, maybe conquer one place over here, you know, deport them to this new city that they just conquered and vice versa, right? So they make them swap cities. Um, and, you know, it, it really, it really, it's an effective, it was an effective method. It, yeah, it, it certainly was. If you wanted to destroy national identity, you spread, you, you created a diaspora. Um, now, what are the justifications of of this type of terrorism? Was it religious fervor? Um, I mean, yeah, technically speaking, yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they did worship uh, the god Asher, and evidently, um, because Asher wanted... He was like one of many gods, and apparently he was the best of the gods. Everyone's god is the best of the gods, apparently, in this time. But like he was the one, and he wanted all of the lands back where people were worshiping all the other lesser gods. And so the people of Assy- the Assyrian people who worshiped Asher um, were basically instructed by religious decree to go and conquer other lands so that they can give it back to their to their god. So I guess technically speaking, it was religious fervor. But if you look at, again, just the ways that they did this, um, it almost feels like they liked it. You know, Dan Carlin was talking about uh, the one the one uh, um, Assyrian king. And on the one hand, you know, yes, what they did was brutal. Um, but, you know, a lot of empires do brutal things. But what the way that they took it a step further was like the one king decided to sit and watch as they flayed people, right? And it's like religious fervor only goes so far until it's like, all right, you're just straight up crazy. You know, like you, you just, you're a psycho. You like this. Well, a lot of people compare, I've seen historians compare them to modern day ISIS. And it's easy to make that comparison yep. because they're from the same region. Mm-hmm. They're also, they're both from pretty brutal. They're, they're both, they're both brutal and they're from the same region. Um, but, I don't necessarily think like yeah they they worship Asher who they thought was the one true god and um, it seems that Assyrian kings were extremely pious like um, religious training was part of their education system. However, it was just I think it was more so just a sense of, of uh, pragmatism on, on their on their end. So what's interesting about the Assyrian Empire is that. Um, I think that they were using this as an instrument of statecraft. Of course. So yeah, it was a policy. Yeah. Holding the empire together was very difficult. Mm-hmm. Any empire is very difficult to hold together. Um, this was an empire that was scattered in some very geographically isolated areas, uh, such as mountains and deserts. So if you're going down to the Arabian Peninsula, um, scattering across deserts in Syria and deserts in Iraq, um, and then it spreads out all the way to the Caucasus, places like Armenia, as well as in, in parts of Persia. Um, these are spread out areas. A lot of them are, are, are geographically. The, the logistics and the um, ability to move armies there themselves is a major accomplishment mm-hmm. when you really think of it. Mm-hmm. But it's very easy to rebel. It's very easy to... Um, have maybe those two years of independence and oh yeah like we're free let's band together with some other local city states i think that they had in their pragmatic view uh sending a message to prevent anything like that from happening was an absolute necessity to hold on to these uh these frontier zones sure and another interesting thing about assyria is that where, where it was located, where the cities of Asher and Nineveh were located, um, it they didn't really have uh, a lot of materials, strategic materials, right. to sustain the power that they had, even for all the successes they, they have on the battlefield. So they didn't have... Um, they, they lacked hard stone for construction projects. Mm-hmm. They got diorite they had, from no, elsewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's no timber yep. there. Mm-hmm. No um, forest timber is used like for, that, for, yeah. for, mm-hmm. for for fortifications right. and and just building. Um, there's no grasslands. 
right? So no horses, no no cows, no nothing like that. No li- no livestock. And and the area itself is has a relatively small population considered to other areas of northern in northern Iraq. Um, there's a smaller at that time there was a smaller population than that of the places that are closer to the riverbanks. Right. Um, so they resorted to slave labor. Um, creating slaves was pro- a huge incentive for them to create that work, that that labor. Um, th- the fact that Assyria's neighbors had these resources, um, with the addition of them having no natural barriers, which we touched on before, it's in the middle of a of a of a of a crossroad of a marchland, which is our new media company mm-hmm. name, yeah, <laughs> uh, Marchland Media. It means crossroads or borderlands. Um, because we like to talk about borderlands in like places where conflict starts. Yep. It, it, it sure it, it just um it put them in a state of like of uh, a paranoia and the in, in constant sense of insecurity. So their solution was to conquer neighboring states and establish a political and, and military presence that ensured the supply of needed materials. And most importantly, they lacked iron deposits yep. and almost all of their enemies possessed iron weapons before they did. Right. Right. And kind of before you get into the iron age, I, I also want to point out that just as a matter of point, you had to be hard to survive in this area. Right. So as we pointed out, I think abundantly, uh, this was a march land. This was a place where you could easily just get ransacked. And, you know, in our previous episodes about, um, uh, Sumer and Akkad, you know, there was constant fighting for thousands of years. Like that was just a, a product of the geography was fighting. So you had to be hard. So the Assyrians coming up literally just had to be the hardest of all of them, right? They had to be the strongest, the hardest, the, the most, the most metal out of all of them in order to just survive. So it, it's, it's a product of their upbringing as well. Or come up and yeah, absolutely. The same could be said for Russia. I'm not Russia. Uh, for for like Prussia mm-hmm. and the military culture that's developed in in uh, during the German Empire. Absolutely. So, um, iron. So one of the most important stimulus for for the military revolution that happens during this time was six hundred dollars. Was six <laughs> was the six hundred dollars. <laughs> Uh, stimulus. Um, <laughs> Sorry, one of I the had most you. important. <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the most important. It, it was the it was iron discovery of iron and use of iron. Mm-hmm. And iron, interestingly enough, it's employed as a weapon technology first by the Hittites around three thirteen hundred BC or so. Right. Um, but they also disappear over the so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they disappear. But over the next centuries. It spreads throughout the Near East, and it's important to know, like all technologies, different parts of the world adopt it at different times. Mm-hmm. So, while parts of the Near East adopted iron in, in the second millennium, um, regions in Northern Europe they don't adopt iron until like the sixth century BC right. or so. So, technology spreads at different rates in different parts of the world, and a lot of times there's a huge gap in. Uh, technological progress between regions of the world, especially at this time when there's no mass transit and there's no mass communication. Um, but iron weapons, they were they're, they're they're heated and they're hammered into shape rather than being cast, and, and that makes them stronger. Right. But more importantly, it makes them more reliable than bronze weapons. So, it, it they're they're just more reliable weapons. They're stronger and they're also Iron is more available, right? And it's easier it's more to abundant. extract. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's more abundant. So the plentiful supply of of iron made it possible for these empires to produce these enormous quantities of reliable weapons and um, start fielding these really big armies. So this led to armies. Uh, practicing conscription on a regular basis. So in our last episode, we spoke about the Egyptian empire implementing conscription. And um, they were, you know, they went from, 
from their early periods in the old kingdom and in, in the third millennium, they had like one out of 100 men um, conscripted to join the army. When Thutmose the third, their greatest warrior pharaoh um, of the Egyptian iron is in power, their conscription rises from uh, one to ten percent of the male population. Right. One in well, ten. The conscri- mm-hmm. Yeah, one in ten. One in ten. Well, the conscription of the Iron Age made Egypt look like child's play. Right. Um, military service became the legitimate price for for membership in the larger social order, and it was no longer limited to. Um, no, it, it was no longer limited to defense in times of threat, but it extended to the need to control these far-flung military empires and, and to prevent domestic and, and foreign threats by being ready to uh, project power or project or, or conduct military operations by any at, at any region of the world mm-hmm. to prevent some some Assyrian right. or prevent another society from coming and lopping your head off. It was the, that was the same type of foreign policy that Egypt was practicing right. uh, when they after they were uh, they were occupied invaded and occupied by the Hyksos. It was the it so was the it birth was, of the standing army, really. Yeah, it was. It was a birth. It was the birth of it, and this was this was pre Iron. This is now at a time where there's. Uh, more reliable weapons and it's easier to field them with and you're able to field everyone with a iron sword or an iron axe or iron armor um so it's just a, a, a lot more uh impactful and effective army um but what's what's created in this is that the Iron Age, it gives birth to the National Standing Army based on citizen service. And this constant flow of conscripts required professionals to train and, and, and lead and integrate citizens into soldiers. Mm-hmm. Because if you're going to if you're going to start um, just taking a large part of the population and saying, here's a sword, here's an axe. Uh, start, you know, you're not going to just be like, all right, come to the battlefield at 10 o'clock and, you know, let's see what happens. Let's see what your skill level is. Right. You're going to require a professional staff to train and teach these people how to march and how to hold a sword and how to how swing it, bow, yeah. how to swing it. Like, you know, what are you good at? Are you going to be cavalry? Are you going to be uh, an archer? Mm-hmm. Are you going to be inf- light infantry? Are you going to be heavy infantry? Are you going to be logistics? Sometimes it came down to yeah. that, you know? Like, are you big and strong? Can you hold a shield in a phalanx? Can right. you, you know, and then teach you these formations because these armies had to be, uh, you know, for example, phalanx, uh, which was being used in Mesopotamia for, for centuries before the Greeks started using them. Um, it requires a lot of cohesiveness yeah. with your unit. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's a basically you're forming a, a, a kind of wall that's like going to bat. Right, it, it's like that's basically bumping into each other and hitting each other. It's kind of, I've always thought of these uh, ancient battles and medieval battles uh, with phalanxes and a lot of like shield use and shield walls as uh, offensive and defensive linemen going up Absolutely. against each other, yeah. like trying to, they're they're like I, trying to get get them off the ball or trying to. I'm sure they had them similar plays block. as well, right? I'm sure they were calling. Yeah. I'm sure they were calling sim- similar audibles at you know at the time. To get people to move around and, and flank them, or you know, try to get to their their quarterback, or I guess you know their We're commander. Pull, yeah, the, the quarterback is their is the commander. Right. And a lot of times, if you kill the commander, the they would just stop. Over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because most of the thing the thing about ancient battles that most of the casualties aren't. So when you see the casualty numbers of an ancient battle, it's always most of the time it's something like outrageously disproportional. So you'll see like. 2,000 people died on this side, and then like 100 people died on that that side, mm-hmm. on the winning side. And the reason is, is because most people don't die in the actual like hand-to-hand fighting. Most people die in a pursuit. Mm. So when a formation breaks in that, and the people panic and start the run, right. that's when the cavalry comes start in and starts them cutting them down mm-hmm. and, yeah. and just and knocking them off because they don't have that cohesive unit right. that's protecting them. So um, it's... Uh, it's important. It's important to train your staff 
is, is a point is uh, where, where I'm getting at. Right. So you require that professional army staff. So now that's and a the, job now, <laughs> you know, there, there's a yeah. whole industry there, you know, and to put this into context, um, arguably the next time nations start creating armies like this, um, after, you know, the fall of the Roman empire, where they have a large scale ro- uh, a large scale, uh, foreign army. Um, and this isn't like a concrete role, but at least in Europe, we don't see this until, like Napoleon, right? Where you take where he's drafting these large scale That's armies yeah. and, and has professional staffs and general staffs to training them. So these a lot of these ancient armies have the same level of sophistication as mil- militaries from the 18th and 19th century. Mm-hmm. It doesn't apply yeah. for everything, but I think kind of generally you can take a military from 600 an Assyrian military from the from the seventh century, throw them in the 800s, 800 AD. And they'll wipe the floor. Right, they would absolutely with like ruin. a Saxon army, right. yeah, or yeah. or with a uh, a Frankish army. Um, so a show I've been watching lately. I've just I started binging. I, I told you it was the Last Kingdom. Have mm-hmm. you ever heard of yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you heard of it? Yeah, you I, it? I haven't watched it yet, but I might I might pick it up. Where where can you get it? I, now? It's on Netflix. Mm-hmm. It's I love it. I've I've just I just I don't know how I just heard about it, but it's really really good. It's about the um, it's about the Danish conquest of, uh, of England mm-hmm. and it's about like the Saxon armies fighting the Danish armies. Yep. It's really good. It's kind of like, it has like a, a, a swashbuckling main character who's really funny. Um, but one of the things that I, I think they really do right in that show is that when they show armies, um, they don't really have like all the CGI bullshit, mm-hmm. like in Lord of the Rings. Like every yeah. character on screen is CGI, pretty much. Yeah. Um, even at the end of Game of Thrones, I think a lot of that stuff was CGI. Yeah, yeah. There's no practical um, people. And also, by the last season of Game of Thrones, the battle scenes were so dumb. <laughs> yeah. The the last battle scene well, I think in Game can, of Thrones. I think we can the, agree the whole the whole fucking series went downhill uh, in those last seasons. But that's the, the last the, the that battle scene where. Uh, they're fighting the White Walkers, mm-hmm. where they send the, the Dothraki cavalry. Right, it's like yeah, into the just dark go ahead. at go, night. Yeah, go go kill them. Is perhaps the dumbest scene I've ever right. seen. It's uh, it was the dumbest movie. thing I've seen yeah. in that show. Mm-hmm. I don't understand how uh, they were. It, it would have been better not to even show the battle mm-hmm. than to have that. Yeah. In my opinion, mm-hmm. just have it like a low scale thing, like the battle of the Blackwater Bay, right? Where it's like. In the books, it's a lot more grand, but in the show, it's you're only you have like a small set with right. like maybe a hundred guys small slice of fighting. Mm-hmm. They would have been better off doing something like that than the shit they pulled yeah. in Game of Thrones yep. season eight and the Battle of Winterfell. Right. But I digress. Something they do well in the show is that they show how small and disorganized these armies are. Mm-hmm. They show like, um, like two hundred men is like really really important. They're like, oh, he's raising two hundred men. And that's how disorganized, that's how kind of small a lot of these militaries were right. in the early medieval periods. I feel like um, I've been on a, on a subway car with more people. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. So the reason why I'm not totally going off the rails on purpose, <laughs> I, I, but the point I'm trying to make is that the militaries that emerge in the Iron Age, um, in the early Iron Age, were much bigger and much more and much more sophisticated and organized in a lot of militaries uh, from like a thousand years after the fall of Rome. Right. Now, um, the guy that actually brings brings in, because um, like I said, Assyria. Now we want to show off the rails that. I need to get back on track. <laughs> so the Assyrian king that first implements iron weapons, because like I said, they weren't using them before, was Sargon II. Not to be confused with of Akkad. Sargon, he's Sargon of Akkad's son. Not really. <laughs> no, he's not. But but he did he, choose the name because that would help him cement the um uh like his stake to the throne, so to speak, right? To legitimize himself. Uh, I don't. I don't actually think we act, we know what his real name was. That was just his like throne yeah. name. 
there there is he's actually he's a very interesting guy. So Sargon the Second, he is considered by a lot of people the greatest Assyrian king. Um, he's the founder of the uh, Sargonid dynasty, which was the last dynasty to rule uh, rule Assyria before they fell. Mm-hmm. Um, he was son of the great Assyrian king named Tiglath Pilazar the Third, who ruled between 745 BC to 727 BC, and um, he was actually not the chosen heir, but he likely orchestrated a coup, deposing his older brother, who was the chosen heir of Tiglath Pilazar. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that you say that because he most likely um, chose the name Sargon to have some type of king title name. Like I am the, I am the bloodline of Sargon, the great Mesopotamian emperor. Right. Exactly. Um, Yeah. Like my blood guy goes all the way back to the great Sargon. Great Sargon. I actually do think that he said that if if I'm not mistaken, I think he actually do like did legitimize a claim to that. Like if you trace my lineage back, because because these are Assyri- the Assyrian peoples, these ancient Mesop- Mesopotamian peoples, like they're in, they, these history scales go on for thousands of years, not hundreds of years. So like they could say you know that stuff, and and they could be like, yeah, I was uh, I, I'm delineated from Sargon of Akkad, you know, thirty five times over or something like that, you know, thirty five times removed or something. Um, but yeah, he needed some legitimacy because he, because he was the son of a guy who probably did a coup d'etat well to each his own yeah but these people took these type of bloodlines very seriously of course because blood it was all about blood like oh he has good blood right. oh he has the blood of a king this guy's a king like right. you know they would kill you if you had the blood of the king and you were a, a possible threat to mm-hmm. someone's uh legitimacy to the throne right but this guy during his reign they carried out no fewer than 10, 10 major wars um and or conquests or suppressions uh within a 16 year period and the result of these these conquests led to an empire that stretched from the persian gulf to the mediterranean sea it was the largest empire the world had ever seen up to that point mm-hmm. it wasn't surpassed until the persian empire and Sargon, he comes to power in 722 BC. And he's actually a really interesting guy from from what I've read about him. So he was a mathematician. He was an architect. He could speak multiple ancient languages. Yep. And he was a historian. And one of the guys who I've been reading a lot about, um, about Sargon II is a, a military historian named Richard Gabriel, who... I'm going to be borrowing a lot from him over the next like 10 minutes when I talk about him. Um, but I'm going to sort of direct quote. So Sargon II was a collector of texts of the ancient period written on clay tablets and constructed a library to catalog and preserve them. It also seems likely that he edited some of the accounts of the ancient battles with a specific view to making certain the routes of advance described in them were accurate. Presumably, we by rewalking the battlefields. So, what what makes that kind of uh, uniquely special is that this guy kind of looked at he reviewed ancient text or like ancient uh, battles, and he was like, "I want to make sure this is right." Yeah, he was like, "I'm gonna." Like a, he like he was like a mythbuster of his time, right? He was like, "I'm gonna make sure that they wrote this down correctly." So he would go and he would walk these battlefields and be like, okay, like this could have happened here. here um, okay. I can see like cavalry coming down this hill right. or, Oh, I can see that, you know, this infantry position had the high ground right here. Right. Oh, or okay. That doesn't really make much sense. What would it do? So he mm-hmm. would, um, he was, he was an actual historian who would in- do investigative. Uh, uh, he would investigate these battles that, that came down from myth and, and he would try to learn as much as possible. Um, so I just, I find him, uh, kind of a, uh, he's an interesting character. He was also very pious as in most Assyrian Kings were. 
So just like a hard dedication to Asher. But I mean, these guys have, when you're a prince, because uh, he was still a prince before he performed the coup on his brother, mm-hmm. uh, they're, they're getting the best education at that time, which was quite good because the ancient Assyrians, like not only were they military power, but they also had, they also had a lot of scientific innovations right. as well mm-hmm. so they were the first to divide years into uh 365 days right um they used the base they 12 the first... system so it's why we have so many 12 based things right like yeah months, exactly right? mm-hmm. they were the first to divide circles into into 360 to uh 360 degrees mm-hmm. um they something that's really cool is that they preserved a lot of the ancient literature such as the epic of gilgamesh yep. And the seven tablets of creation, yep, yep, yep. which was a story of creation that is incorporated into Genesis by the Jews during during the, their Babylonian captivity. These could have been lost forever. Right. They also destroyed Babylon. So, <laughs> I mean, I guess, uh, you know, give had, and take. <laughs> give and take. Yeah. So I guess they had they, they, at least they were like, OK, we're going to destroy this place. We're going to, you know, preserve some of their. Right. Their we'll, we'll write some we're stuff gonna, down. You know, we're not total heathens. Right. But so something to take note is like how large, um, how different this animal was in, in far as um, the sizes of military that we're putting on the field. So in our last episode, these past three episodes, we've kind of progressed. Sargon of Akkad was fielding an army of around 5,400 people, right. which was huge was massive, at the time. Right. This is around 2400 BC, so the third millennium. About a thousand years later, we have Thutmose the Third, who's fielding armies that are between twenty thousand to thirty thousand people. Mm-hmm. That's even huger, right. and they're also projecting power, you know, within like a two hundred and fifty mile uh, radius of Memphis, the capital of Egypt mm-hmm. at that time. Now, what the Assyrian Empire is doing? So this is about six hundred years, seven hundred years later after, uh, you know, Egypt's main uh you know height and imperial power they're putting out armies of 150 to 200,000 men right it's like whole major cities worth of people in an army they're combating they're com- they're putting out field armies of 50,000 right and they're mixing them up with uh like infantry chariots um cavalry uh, light infantry. They were known to uh, mix up their. They had like a really unique system where they um, had these units of both infantry and uh, an archer and, and archers who would. Um, it would be like half and half. So you know they'd have the option to either go and kind of get up close and personal, or they could just snipe them. Uh, snipe them. It it was just a, a really unique system, and since their armies were so huge, that they were able to. To, to do that um, it, in modern times, the size of an Assyrian field army was equal to five modern heavy American divisions or almost eight Soviet field divisions. Yeah. That's nuts. That's a quote I pulled from Richard, Richard Ga- Gabriel. So when a raid for battle, the army took up an area of 250 yards across the front, 2,500 yards, deep. yards. 2,500 yards yeah. across the front and 100 yards deep. The Assyrian army was also the first army to be entirely equipped with iron weapons. Mm-hmm. They, all, they invented large cavalry squadrons and could process 3,000 new horses a month. So what they... Cavalry wasn't really used prior. I mean, it, it was used, but not like the Assyrians were doing it. Everyone knows the Assyrians um, as the chariot guys, the people who had like these chariot units. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had chariot units, but their main uh, innovation that they had was their, I mean, their infantry was awesome, but they had awesome cavalry. And they created systems to produce horses and, and breed horses and, and have a continuous flow of new horses uh, every single month they also like conquered a bunch of like horse step people uh and that's how they are able to like you know up their game in the cavalry front that's how sargon the second dies too yep. but we won't get there just yet 
he die he dies by fighting the Scythians. Mm-hmm. Scythians. Um, so so to go back to Egypt. So the Egyptian army of uh, 1300 BC had a range of 1250 miles. So by t- 1250 miles by 200 miles, or more than twice the range of the earlier period. Assyria has conducted military operations from Asher to Susa to Thebes, an area comprising 1250 miles by 300 miles. So they were able to... It's 100 miles broader than, yeah. than the Egyptian army of that range. And one of the biggest innovations that they had was the was their footwear. Right. They had the best Jordans. They had the best. They had the. They had uh, fresh Nikes. So the Assyrian army was the first to improve on the military footwear of ancient armies. The Assyrian soldier wore a knee-high leather jackboot with the th- with thick leather soles, complete with hobnails to improve traction. The boot also had thin plates of iron sewn in the front to provide it for protection for the shin. The high boot provided effective ankle support for troops who fought regularly in rough terrain and served as excellent protection in cold weather, rain, and snow. The boot kept foot injuries to a minimum. It is one of the primary reasons why the Assyrian army was able to move easily over rough terrain in all kinds of weather. Following the Assyrian lead, military boots of various designs became standard equipment for all the later armies of the Iron Edge. Age. The growth and tactical flexibility of small units was also evident in the ability of armies to develop an all-weather capability for ground combat. The Assyrians regularly fought in the summer and winter months and even carried out siege operations in the winter. Sargon's campaign against the Uratu, which is modern-day Armenia, um, and this is interesting because the Uratu, Uratu? Uratu. Uartu, so I pronounce it somewhat right. I'm, for anyone listening for the first time, um, if you're getting steamed up about my pronunciations, you should listen to other episodes <laughs> because I pronounce I I pronounce Danny's last name wrong for a year into the show. Right. <laughs> um, and I've known Danny for like eight years at this point. Yeah. So um, there's. They, they treated them kind of like how the Nazis treated Jews. Like they had all sorts of texts calling them like the, what's the, the, uh, Uber troop, the, the, the Uber true problem or the final solution oh, the for Uber them to problem. Yeah. Yeah. The Uber two problem. Mm-hmm. The final solution. I'm not sure if Hitler took that from the Assyrians or not. Um, Maybe he did. He was the student of history. Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose so because they, they would have discovered the uh, you know cuneiform tablets by then. So, but they just they just wanted to eliminate these were the they were peoples in Armenia in and kind of like the around kind of like the Caspian. See Azerbaijan, Iran area mm-hmm. across the Zigros Mountains, and they traveled all that way just to kill them all. Right? They would they just, they went up and journeyed all the way there. Like, meh, we gotta we gotta kill them all. Um, but Sar- Sargon's campaign provided a textbook example of the development of improved tactical proficiency. The campaign was conducted almost six hundred miles from the Assyrian capital in the late fall. Sargon's army, complete with contingents of infantry, cavalry, and heavy chariots, traversed mountains, streams, and rivers on the route of march. Travel through the mountain passes was complicated by heavy snows. One pass was so high and heavily blocked by snow that the enemy did not bother to defend it. Sargon negotiated the pass, caught the enemy by surprise, fought and won a major battle, and still had enough combat power left to besiege and capture a fortified city. Um, so there's a really interesting story about this battle that I, that I read where it's, I don't know, a lot of this sounds like some hype, but you know, they, this, there's a story about how Sargon and his army, they had to, uh, go over these mountains and go through all this path, these passes. And when they finally arrive to fight, they're all exhausted. I'm sure they would be. They're just like, fuck. And, And Sargon turns around and he sees it. He's like, shit. He's like, all these guys are so tired. These guys are all fresh. I don't know what to do. Like, this is going to be a tough fight. Um, 
like I usually we'd be able to beat them. Like I need I need somehow to like spark up some energy before we're screwed. We have the surprise, but they have just fresh legs. Yeah, the, the fresh legs mm-hmm. right now. So according to Sar, according to the historical tablets, um, who knows how real this is or not? A lot of this stuff that comes from kings, I tend to think is exaggeration rather than you fact. You give him the Space Jam but Sargon, water, right? He leads a cavalry charge. <laughs> He's like, oh, I got it. Oh, I'm going to put the team on my back. And he leads the cavalry charge and all of his troops seeing their, their king lead this cavalry charge. They get invigorated with energy and then they, you know, in the words of Sargon, uh, as you can probably imagine, it's probably something well, you know, about pillars of corpses. <laughs> yeah. so like he burned all the maidens. Pillars and of like, corpses uh, and flayed yeah. enemies and all that <laughs> stuff um, happened. But Sargon was one of the Syrian kings who was like had some kind of mutual respect for, uh, you know, he's like, yeah, I flayed them and killed them. But, you know, they, you know, they were pretty cool. You know, they right. they took their flaying like a right. man. <laughs> he was that type of, of, uh, of Assyrian king. Well, because he was a scholar. Yeah. <laughs> You know, he was like, I, yeah. He didn't. He didn't whine like a bitch when I uh, burnt him alive. And uh, they had pretty nice books on on hand too, so I was able to re- get some good reads in. Oh, some nice, some nice books. Oh man, but he wasn't. He didn't destroy Babylon. Um, it was, I believe, his Babylon was destroyed later. They had a really interesting the relationship in the Sargonid, with Babylon. The Sargonid line, I think, that destroyed Babylon. It was. It was so. I forget which who destroyed Babylon. Uh, it was. I'll Google it. Oh, his Sinasherbib. 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 Sinasherbib is a, is a guy who destroys Babylon. But it's interesting because Assyria and Babylon had a relationship, almost like how the Romans had a relationship with ancient Greece. So, yeah, the Romans were at, at the height of Roman power or when after the Punic Wars, when Rome becomes like the regional power in the Mediterranean and they're able to conquer uh, Greece with just a couple of legions, really. Um, it's a whole, it's a really interesting story, the Roman conquest of mm. Greece. It's it's like kind of this engulfing thing that happens over a 50 year period, but I'll save that for another yeah, show maybe. since people think we go off topic too much. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what what happens is that um, they or, or what the relationship is is that it's kind of like how Athens is to Athens. Rome. Athens is to Rome is how Babylon is right, to right because that was the, that was like the the symbolic or like cultural you know epicenter of Mesopotamia for like ever right. Uh, I, you know, you might re- recall one of the ancient wonders of the world was there, the hanging gardens at Babylon, you know, um, it was super culturally relevant. Um, and even though they were at odds with one another, you know, they, they would often kind of pull their punches as far as like when, when they would wreck, you know, their, their Babylonian neighbors, they wouldn't totally decimate, um, the city of Babylon. Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be until, uh, Sennacherib, as you said, um, that they actually did raise Babylon. Um, but it, it was of cultural uh, um, importance, just just like, as you said, Rome uh, admired uh, a Greek culture and even adopted a whole lot of Greek culture. They, they you know, took their cues from the art, from the culture, uh, from the pottery making, from the sculptures. Um, I mean, even their gods are pretty pretty damn similar uh with just different names and stuff like that you know um but they were just more militarily powerful (laughs) like the romans were more militarily powerful than than the greeks as were the assyrians way more militarily powerful than than the babylonians yeah they um apparently throughout their history they they had a kind of a longer rope with Babylon because they didn't want to ever have to destroy the city because they respected it so much. But eventually they, uh, they had a King who did, who did, who did sack Babylon. Uh, but at least a lot of the, the, uh, things were preserved. Yep. Most of it. So in short, um, Assyria is, 
the Assyrian Empire, when it falls, because it does fall, and what's unique about this is that it's not like the Roman Empire where Roman, there's kind of like a, a, a peak of Rome that, that happens in like, as far as like territorial expansion, it happens somewhere in like a hundred, like eighty nine A.D. or or like a one eighty during the time of Marcus Marcus Aurelius, which I believe was emperor from like one fifty A.D. to one eighty nine A.D. somewhere along those lines. I forget the exact date, but that was like the the, the height of their geographic empire. I'm not so sure about the standard of living, but at least height of uh, expansion that's how a lot of historians judge the rise and fall of an empire or if an empire is rising or if they're in decline it's by their territorial expansion Mm -hmm. they fell when they were at their height and they fell fast which makes it interesting and they fell like a like a like a deck of cards Mm -hmm. like a ton of bricks they fell rome had this this 300 year slow line right the slow, the slow burn, where uh, there was a lot of different reasons as far as civil war and corruption in the government, and um, you know, so a lot of people b- b- uh, blame barbarian invasions. It was like a something that lasted over three hundred years, and you know, the empire split into mm-hmm. two, and in the eastern western, western empire, um, this was just. Boom! Yeah, it's it was gone. like for, the, and for those who uh, like or follow astronomy, it's it's com- comparative to you know uh, the death of stars, right? So very large stars like Assyria, you know, they end in a supernova, right? Like a giant explosion, as opposed to Rome, which kind of you know becomes a red dwarf and like fizzles out after a while, you know, slowly and quietly uh, into space. Um, yeah, the, the Assyrians were definitely the supernova for sure. They were they were certainly a supernova, and the reason why they fall so hard is because there's a civil war. So, um, Asher Asher Bonapol, Asher Nasserpol, um, Asher Asher ba- Nasserpol. No, it's Asher Bonapol. Asher Nasser Bonapol. One of those guys. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Asher. No, that's a different one. This is Asher, ba- but Asher Bonapol. Or was it Sin Char Ixum? No, that was one of the commanders. Never mind. That was Asher 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 Bonapol. I have it written down. Okay, Danny. I believe it was Asher Bonapol. Asher Bonapol. <laughs> Got it. When he dies, um, there's a civil war that breaks, and this happens all all the time. Yeah. Every time a king dies, this, this yeah. happens all the time. And so, what happens when there's a civil war? All of the rulers all, all of the um states that have been conquered by Assyria are like oh there's a civil war i think it's time to take advantage of this and the uh, an alliance is created mainly by the uh babylonians in the Medes right. of like of persia they were they were the dominant culture before the Persians took over Iran. They created an alliance and they didn't, wait, didn't the Medes take the over Medes, Babylon first and then but like the Babylonians helped them to do that. Yeah. Right. And then they ruled over Babylon but like kinda let them do their own thing also. And then they were like the the main players. Isn't that how it went down? Yeah, it was the Medes who destroyed the right. Assyrians. But also the Scythians. The Scythians? The Scythians? It was it, it, Scythians is correct, but it was it was mainly most people credit the Medes for destroying because the Medes were badass right. too. They ravaged Assyria and they destroyed all their major cities, and they sacked Nineveh. And when they sacked Nineveh, they sacked Nineveh the same way that the Assyrian Empire sacked their neighbors. Yep. They f- killed everyone. They they. Gave them the Carthage right. treatment. They burned it to the ground. They, um, they crushed all the bones. They turned it to dust. They put salt in the fields. They put prickly, prickly uh, plants in the in the you know areas, and nothing would grow. Yeah, it was all, all crazy. And and the moral of this story is is the they were destroyed because of their foreign policy, right. because they were so right. brutal. 
and this is ties into the overall theme of our of our of our podcast of, of like foreign policy and geopolitics. When you act like assholes, other going to other countries are going to treat you like assholes right. too. Your neighbors are going to right. hate you. And the moment there's an opening, they're going to strike at you and they're going to do to you what you did to them and probably worse. And that's why nobody knows what Nineveh is. Or nobody knew what Nineveh was. Nobody knew what Nineveh is, but most people don't know what Nineveh right. is. Uh, the average history student doesn't never heard of Nineveh unless you were, you probably heard it in a class, in a, in a history class I'm passing but it might, you never sh- it might show up in the what Bible it was. actually now I'm thinking of it yeah it does show up in a Bible but most people it's an ancient city that has been forgotten and the sacking of Nineveh was maybe one of the most important historical events ever because it ended that old world right it ended it ended it was the end of the world that was that was dominated by either Egypt or dominated by uh, Sumerian or Sumerian city states, and the structures that the Assyrians put in place led to the Pers- led to the uh, rise of the Persian Empire because they were able to come in and take those structures that were already in place and implement something that worked a little bit better, a little bit ni- a nicer empire to go back to what we were mm-hmm. talking about prior. Mm-hmm. And the Persians are eventually conquered by the Alexander the Great and then split up into a bunch of different countries when Alexander the Great dies. But Alexander the Great, he connects the east and the west together so it's kind of like the bridge between the old like the very very old old world and the newer old world old old world (laughs) yeah yeah totally like the it was like the 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 end of like the biblical biblical ancient history like it's only an oral mythology like it's so ancient that who cares? It's so whenever the hell back right. when to kind of the new period when we're like, oh, the ancient Greeks and Sparta right. and like, oh, this is the stuff that's not that far back where we can actually put people in our right. shoes history. Um, so I think it's interesting in that aspect. I don't know if yeah, you agree. Yeah, for sure. And that. I think what's interesting about it, you know, you brought it up a little bit in passing a little earlier, but like, you know, you don't know like we for the most part we don't know about the assyrian empire most people don't know about it and uh there was a question that we never asked out loud you know in our notes here but like how many assyrian people do you know they do exist by the way right like there's assyrian actual assyrian people that claim you know uh, an unbroken lineage to you know exactly these people like six thousand years ago or whatever um but um but like they were utterly, utterly scattered to the wind, you know, uh, and, and destroyed and forgotten about. Uh, and it wasn't until we started doing like modern archaeology that we started digging up all of their plates. Can you imagine being the guy that, you know, you found all these like steels and all of these, you know, uh, uh, cuneiform tablets and you didn't know what the hell it said, right? Until they find the Rosetta Stone and we're able to like back translate it. And then you're the guy that finally translates one of these texts. And it's like, I am Asher Nasser Paul. And uh, today I went to, you know, my neighboring city and I totally ransacked them and I burned them and I cut off their fingers and I flayed them. And you're like, what the fuck? Who the fuck are these people? Like, what the fuck did I just find? You know, um, and it's nuts because like these people technically still exist and, and most of them are actually Christians now. Um, uh, and I want to bring this up because I found this super interesting. Do you remember when we were doing the episode a couple weeks back, um, on the election and we were looking through, uh, Trump's, the yeah, the Chaldeans, Chaldeans right? I found yeah, out they're Babylonians. Yeah, dude, I found, so there's, they're from Mesopotamia, the ancient Chaldeans, right? But I found out why, uh, he had like a, a focus group or like a, you know, a set of supporters that were Chaldeans and it's because, uh, evidently the largest diaspora of Chaldeans are in like Detroit, Michigan. 
So, you know, obviously swing state, you know, um, but it, it was just so wild to me because when we were looking through this uh, for that episode, we were looking through like, you know, who are these like focus groups, these like, so, like, you know, blacks for Trump and like, you know, truckers for Trump and like police for Trump and, and like all these things. And then we kept going down. It's like Assyrians for Trump, Chaldeans for Trump. I'm like, we didn't even know what a Chaldean was. Right. And then we had to Google it and we, we learned that it was like previously like an ancient Mesopotamian culture. Uh, and now we're doing this episode on it and I'm like, oh, it all makes sense now. <laughs> um, I see. <laughs> well, unfortunately, the Chaldeans weren't able to get them ahead. No, no. Oh, no, they weren't. Um, no. <laughs> so it's. Uh, yeah, that's our podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Is there anything else that we need to go <laughs> over? So. No. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I had a lot of, I really, the, ancient Assyria is one of my favorite ancient civilizations. Um, so I am enjoying doing these podcasts on, um, and I know Danny does as well on doing these, uh, ancient history podcasts. So I, keep on telling me if you like them or not. Um, rate and review the podcast. Um, let us know if you'd like us doing these shows on ancient history. Um, we'll do more if you guys are enjoying them. We want your feedback. We got good feedback so far. Uh, but rate and review the podcast. Give it a five-star review. Five. That is the number one way to help us grow the show. It grabs the most attention of the show. Uh, and it helps us with, with SEO and all that type of st- stuff behind the scenes. So rate and review the podcast. Um five stars preferably and you can also join our patreon uh our patreon of bro history it should be in the show notes uh we have early episodes sometimes we get some exclusive content in there not as much as lately but we do try to get some exclusive content in there uh but you also get access to our slack group and our slack group's a lot of fun um where we talk shit and talk about politics and stuff uh so you can support you can join that for a dollar a month uh and then yeah that's pretty much everything i needed to plug i I hope you guys had fun and uh give us your feedback 